Yep. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Donna DeSalvo. I'm a senior adjunct curator here at uh, DIA, the Art Foundation. Welcome to DIA Beacon and to our fantastic community day. Um, we are incredibly privileged today to have two extraordinary individuals um, who will talk about a rather amazing um, activity that happened. <laughs> 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 around 1999. Um, and, uh, but before that, I'd like to introduce each of them. Linda Goodbryant is an artist, filmmaker, and founder and president of Project Eats, a living ins installation transforming vacant lots and rooftops into neighborhood-based farms, catalyzing creativity and cultivating greater foods sovereignty across New York City. She's also the founder of Just Above Midtown Gallery, a laboratory that foregrounded the work of African-American artists between 1974 and 1986. She won a Peabody Award for the film Flag Wars, and in 2020 was a recipient of an Anonymous Was a Woman Award and the United States Artist Beresford Prize. She's also a former Guggenheim Fellow. Um, just recently, there was an extraordinary exhibition curated by Thomas Lax, who's with us here today, uh, at the Museum of Modern Art about the Just Above Midtown Gallery. Hopefully, you all got to see that. Laura Portress is a filmmaker and journalist. Her most recent film, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, premiered at the Venice Film Festival, where it won the Golden Lion for the best film, only the second documentary to win the top prize. The film was also nominated for an Academy Award. Her film, Citizen Four, won an Academy Award for Best Documentary, her journalism exposing the U.S. National Security Agency's Global Mass Surveillance Program was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. Linda's collaboration with director Linda Good Bryant, Flag Wars, won a Peabody Award and was nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. I had the great pleasure when I was the chief curator at the Whitney Museum uh, of uh, uh, seeing the exhibition of her work curated by Jay Sanders, her first museum exhibition ever, um, take place. And so I'm very delighted to reconnect today with Laura and uh, with Linda. And I'm really going to leave it to both of them to set up what you're about to see. So Laura, Linda, over to you. you you've got your mic. Wow, where do we begin? Um, well, first of all, it's really wonderful to be here um, in this space with both Donna and Linda. Um, I don't know, I thought maybe we could begin with, I mean, I'll just, maybe with the idea. Okay. And what you remember about <laughs> the idea and, and what I remember and see if those two things align. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. We're going to discover. That's great. All right. You are going to find, find out when we align and when we don't. But anyway, I had uh, written a screenplay uh, that uh, was called Still Lives, and the, the film was to take place um, at MoMA, was the idea. Now, how we were going to get MoMA, I have no idea, but <laughs> it was going to take place at MoMA. Um, I heard that there was this factory in Beacon, and that the DIA Foundation was interested in this factory. Uh, but the deal hadn't gone down yet. Uh, and so I was intrigued, because I said, it's a factory. It hasn't been open in a long, 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 long time. It makes sense, given that the film is going to like show the decay of MoMA during this gala. So the film all took place <laughs> at a gala at MoMA. And, and, and somehow or another, things were going to, you know, MoMA was going to just, yeah, dissolve. <laughs> so the idea of like going somewhere like a factory that hadn't been open for a long time and actually shooting the film in this building made sense uh, to me. And so I got on the phone and called folks and said, come with me. Uh, and let's go see this factory that Dee is interested in and see if that's not the perfect place for still lives to be shot. Mm -hmm. A lot of that aligns with what I remember, <laughs> not all of it. Um, Linda and I had met in a workshop and we um, were, had 
just set, um, made a plan to, to start a film called Flag Wars, which we, made, which we made in Columbus, Ohio. But we hadn't started filming yet. I don't think we'd started filming yet. But we'd gotten a camera, and it was a Canon XL1. Um, and we hadn't used it and hadn't tested it out. And I know we were like, OK, we're going to test out this camera. It, Linda's right. She, so she, she had the screenplay, which is an incredible screenplay, which actually, I think, um, should still be made. Have you, did you ever read it, Tommy? It's I mean, this screenplay is so good, and um, the film should get. Uh, so we were we were talking, and and you know, Linda and I were a little bit naive um, about filmmaking because we just thought we could make the film. Like you know, even though we hadn't um, made fiction films before, um, um, but we thought like, okay, yeah, we can, we can do that. That should be no problem. And we'll make a documentary. Um, and but we decided to go. But you know, it 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 wasn't just we wanted to check it out. I mean, I think it was always we are going to break, break into the play, break, into break into the deal. Like, it was announced that it would be that, that, that this building was going to be turned into a museum space and we should just all get in a car rather than calling up Dia and saying, like, we're artists and do you think we could look at it and maybe we're thinking about making a movie, which might have been the way to go about um, seeing the space. Uh, we, we didn't. <laughs> we got in a car with the intention, I think, of breaking in. Yeah, oh, well, definitely. Yeah, there was no way else we were going to get, no, no. get it. But I, but I also want to go back a bit. I had written this screenplay, and I want to give all credit to Laura, because Laura um, said, we should do this documentary. And I'm going, no, I've written a screenplay. I'm not doing documentaries. And she said, we should do this documentary first. Uh, and we came to an agreement that we were going to do the documentary. Uh, we were going to shoot it, direct cinema, and um, edit it in a way that it unfolded like a narrative film. Because that was my whole thing. I'm doing narrative films. I'm not doing documentaries. It was one of the best experiences, uh, I'll speak for myself, um, that I've had in life was doing Flag Wars and living in a community for almost three years and, and shooting 300 hours and stuff. But, but Laura was just, yeah, you do, the narrative film after we do the documentary. Um, maybe we should just introduce who, who, who joined us. Maybe, Linda, you could introduce. The, and then we'll show, it's, a, it's about 10 minutes. We'll show it, and then we'll come back. Yeah, so uh, I got on the phone with Artist, and it was uh, basically Artist. But there were enough people that required a second car. So one of the artists had a car, Steve Stasso. Um, and so then I called uh, a friend of mine, Barry Rosen, who's kind of stiff, <laughs> right? And I said, Barry, I need a car. <laughs> I need two cars to go to Beacon, New York. <laughs> and he was like, huh? You want to do what? I said, break in. Oh, I think Yop has a car. And so Barry's friend, Yop, who's stiffer than Barry, said, yeah, I'll drive. Uh, and so two, car, two cars filled with artists and dealers, uh, <laughs> Yop and, and Barry, uh, came to Beacon to this building. Okay. Okay. I think we'll show it, and we'll then we'll come back. <laughs> Wow. 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 Wow.
It's amazing. It's amazing. Miles of wood floors. Shit. The light is incredible. We can just turn on a switch. I mean, you know. So what? The light? I hear the hum. I mean, to get the electricity the and uh, heat, even. I can, I can if we shoot in the winter. There's a hum of something. You know, it's got to have yeah, heat Steve, in it. Steve, Why are you laughing? Oh, no, it has heat. It has heat in it. Uh, if you cause a fire, it has a fire hydrant, so... Uh, Where do you see the fire hydrant? Right behind you. Yeah. It is incredible. It's incredible. And look, these places where I guess I must have put the presses. Mm. Mm. Yeah, look at there are just thermostats for the heating. Yeah, I'm saying it. Oh, I don't think it's going to be a problem. And think about it, you've got all these these uh, windows. We can do some amazing shit with light. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, amazing shit with light. Amazing shit with light. Mm -hmm. I, Linda, I thought your thing takes place at a gala at night. It does. But I'm talking about, I'm saying, I'm saying, uh, you know those big lights, the fill oh, lights. Yeah, right, big, right, that's right, right. what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Or even, you know, like if we get, I mean, Flavin or somebody to create some shit. You know what I'm saying? I mean, he's artists, dead. he's dead. But I mean, you know, someone <laughs> of that. Right. You I know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, you're right. Wow, that's that's just, you know, in terms of how we affect that space inside there, we could sculpt that goddamn space. Lights outside here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You could sculpt areas in there. Mm -hmm. Wow. I just... <laughs> we need to get the mic. <laughs> wow. You know, it's not a band. It's a work guy. It could be working for the railroad, but I don't know. There's a truck there. He's on this property and he's carrying something. So. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, yeah, this, well, this is unlocked. Right, this is the open access by car. So, I don't know. Wow. Where's Steve? Steve? I mean, and, uh, we don't know. We can't see him. We can't even see him around there. Fred is in. Besides those skylights, Fred is in. I expect you in there. Look, okay, get Allison. You got her? Let's no, play. no, guys, like 50 cents, 50 cents. <laughs> Let's go. Where's Steve? Steve? Oh, no, let's get this up here. Where do I find Steve? <laughs> <laughs> it's charmed. God loves us. God loves us. We're in. We're in the space, Laura. We're in the space. <laughs> I didn't offer him any money. Let's go. Looks like he back. I don't know. I think yeah, let's just let him say we heard about the museum plans. We just wanted to look. We want to go talk to him? Yeah. Look who's looking at
Uh, how quickly can you switch tapes? Because the guy asked for, he wanted to know what we were using the pictures for. Oh. And he got a call. Okay. So I just want to make sure that we can, we're can. we not giving him our footage. Okay. So you might come and ask me the He said he got a call for it right there. Find a new chair and tape right there. Okay. You speed it up, and if they come, we'll stop them and you just keep moving. I think I'll see him first, though. Okay. Hey, Fred. <laughs> he is basically saying he had got a call. He's the he's the quarterback. And he said he got a call. Thanks. There was a break. There in. was a break. Oh, really? So we didn't break in. Well, I told my client. Well, in the window. All the time, yeah. <laughs> I think it's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that a call that was a break in? Because the other guy started to call, uh, and then the guy said no, uh, so. So we're going to be arrested. No. <laughs> he said he got a call. Oh, see, there's a cop right there. I wanted to ask right away, how did that all... <laughs> How did that all end, guys? You left us in a bit of suspense <laughs> at the end there, so I have to ask uh, what was the, uh, what happened at the end there? He, uh, the police officer took all of our IDs, uh, and then he went, I can't remember if he went to his car, or, he must have taken the car somewhere, because Steve had a joint on him. And <laughs> I said, Steve, you gotta drop the joint. I'm not dropping the joint. We cannot get arrested with a fucking joint. You got you to you gotta drop the joint. He, he never dropped the joint. Uh, and then the policeman came back and said that none of us had shown up on any whatever uh, that we show up on if, you're, <laughs> if we're bad people, I don't know, or people that should be arrested. Uh, and um, I think he was just overwhelmed by the number of us. You know, was, that was going to be the rest of his day and night. And he said, just <laughs> go back to the city. <laughs> so that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, it was good. It sort of refreshed my memory to rewatch it. Um, so first of all, I haven't um, been back to the space since I visited it with Linda. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'm doing a bit of traveling, and but um, so it's great to be back. But I, I just wanted to correct a few things. I or just remember because when you were talking about the lights, I think the plan was not just to look at the space, but to take advantage of this window of opportunity between Dia have, had acquired it and it would take how long it would take them through their bureaucracy and planning and architects and all the things to sort of sneak back in again and make the movie. <laughs> like, like the idea was to like, oh, there's this empty space. We, we, we should take advantage of the, the, the oh, fact yeah. that the space. And, and, and I just definitely want to correct the fact, because Linda said that we had a rational conversation about what film to do. That, 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 I think Linda, <laughs> Linda's conception of time is not like everyone's. And I think the idea was all those things could happen together, that we could make a documentary in Columbus, Ohio, and that we could also shoot a fiction film, and that that could all happen, you know, sort of at the same time. I don't think there was a kind of uh, idea of like, you know, a schedule of how those two films would happen. I think, I think they were all teed up and um, were, you know, trying to happen simultaneously. Someone who wants to. Linda, what year was this? 
1999. 1999. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's to me, um, yeah, I mean, I see this as, well, it could be a movie in so many different kinds of ways, obviously. Um, um, but I'm kind of curious, too, for the two of you, so in a way you kind of came together through Flag Wars, the film that you made about Columbus, Ohio. And so I'm just curious what your perceptions, did you spend any time in Beacon itself? Did you come up and just do the break-in and go back? And, uh, you know, just curious your thoughts at that time. Uh, just came back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to the break-in and... <laughs> to do the, yeah. And to figure out how to make the movie. And Laura, is, she's, she's a bit more accurate. That's true. The idea was to, to do both. Like, to shoot the film on, um, before Dia actually started doing any renovations or anything. And what might Which you have done? Which was the idea of, like, we could just sculpt that space inside yeah. with yeah. light from outside and create different spaces within MoMA at Dia <laughs> in a factory. Yeah. Uh, we could do that with lighting from outside. Yeah. Yeah. And I do have to say that it, um, that this is a remarkable artwork that um, Linda's created in the script, and um, and so I think one of the great things about coming back here is to return to it. Um, but yeah, I still think that film should be made. Yeah, will we see this um, maybe film based on? I don't know. Y'all got to. Can y'all take a break? <laughs> <laughs> it should be shiny. Yeah. Do you consider going downstairs? When you're here? I, I probably I didn't have a chance. Somebody to went it. downstairs, but I can't remember. There, there's actually more footage, so um, we'll have to see. But I do remember somebody going downstairs if we all did go downstairs. What is the total footage that you have you about know, this? Is it, it much when did you edit this? it? Because I, I, Linda cut it. I shot it. Linda and then Linda. Yes. When did you cut it? Laura's just now saying it. <laughs> like you all saying this. So when did when did I you cut edit it for uh, installation? Um, um, that was in a gallery in 2021. So you filmed it, and then you cut it. You edited it. Yeah, I didn't even know the footage. Like, I, I didn't even know that Linda still had it. So it was, it was amazing to, to, and I saw it actually at the jam show. So because it's you, it's at the um, when you go into MoMA, it was like one of the first rooms, and I was like, holy shit! It's so that I had that encounter and then seeing it again. So I was really glad to. Well, I mean, Laura, you're, you're sort of, you know, I mean, your work is, I don't want to say it's about break-ins, um, but... Um, <laughs> you can, you can you say know, that. But anyway. in a way, yes. It's, I think it's a compliment. Yeah, it is a compliment. <laughs> so, you know, in that sense, it's kind of interesting to see this, you know, yeah. piece at this time, which is... So this is really on, early on, though, for you as a filmmaker when you're doing this. Yeah, yeah, as a doc, particularly documentary. I mean, I had done sort of more experimental, but Linda and I had sort of were just beginning embarking on the on flag wars, and um, we hadn't shot, you know, um, neither of us had shot a, a feature length documentary before. So we're, we're just sort of marching out. And, you know, some of the themes that kind of come up with, I think, in this footage are this sort of like, what can you get away with? Who can get away with what? Um, what kind of like cover story can you use? You know, I think the cover story here is we're artists, you know, which wasn't a lie. Um, uh, and uh, and we, it was similar things would happen as, sort of in Columbus, Ohio. I would say, remember there would be some encounters with authorities and I would always be like, we're just filmmakers, you know, and try to sort of be innocent and, and um, get the camera where we wanted to get it. And yeah, I just recently watched Flag Wars and um, do you want to say a bit about that film. This was made in 2003, correct? I think of, in Columbus, Ohio. Yeah, I think Laura, Laura remembers correctly. You mentioned earlier that we had just gotten that cannon that this was shot on, uh, and so we started shooting in Columbus in, in 1999. Uh, and um, what we, what the film focuses on, uh, is what happens in a historic black community. I'm so loud. Uh, anyway, uh, it's it's your but it's where you grew. Oh, it's for the okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, it's um, but we were look anyway. We were wanted to look at uh, what happens in a historic black community as others move in um, that are gentrifiers for the most part. We looked at, we researched a number of cities. And in fact, there was some stuff in Brooklyn that was going on that looked interesting as well. But anyway, but decided to shoot in Columbus. Um, I think really 
at least from my perspective. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I did not desire to shoot in Columbus, Ohio, but really decided that most people in the world don't realize that there are black people or gay people in Columbus, Ohio, and this film focuses on what happens when gay whites move into a, a black community. Um, yeah. yeah, and I think that that f film kind of emerged from this trip. Linda had made a trip back home and saw that there were rainbow flags in the neighborhood and asked her dad about what's up with the rainbow flags. And, and I thought it was the resurgence of the elderly women in the neighborhood. Uh, they're flower clubs, right? <laughs> now, I lived in New York. I knew what the pride flag was, but I was in Columbus, Ohio, in my neighborhood. So it must be the elderly women have started their flower clubs again. And I said that out loud to my father. And he goes, what's wrong with you? That's what the gay guys put up when they move into the neighborhood. And I said, what are you talking about? He goes, yeah, that's what the gay guys put up when they move into the neighborhood. Uh, and when and, I came and, back. Yeah, yeah. And, and so Linda comes back and shares that story. And we both go, oh, that, that, that's, a, that's a story there. And, you know, and because and then she said that the, and then the, um, the black residents were hanging black national flags, which weren't there before, but that, came, that sort of came out in response to the rainbow flags. And, and how it was that you know, a symbol of pride in the case of the, the, the rainbow flag was sort of being used to mark territory, sort of being, you know, maybe not used in the way in which it, 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 um, its intended purpose. It was, it was saying we have, this block now has been gentrified. And, and so we were interested in like how communities that, that do experience discrimination in the larger society also can perpetuate. And I have to, and, and in the beginning, though, when we thought of the premise or whatever, at least our assumption was, is that it was going to look differently uh, or different because, because here were two groups who were, have been historically, um, you know, uh, battered by the larger society. So um, uh, this will look differently. Um, and we discovered it didn't. Yeah. So... Yeah. It's so interesting thinking about, you know, Beacon community and the history and, of course, the Beacon Historical Society is here all day um, with, you know, extraordinary facts. I mean, I, I know for myself, you know, coming back and forth to Beacon, I got interested in the history and um, our, we have a wonderful archivist who um, has put together uh, an incredible timeline of the history of the, peer, of the I mean, I, I don't know if everyone knows about when Nabisco first took over this, um, or I should say built this building, and the whole idea that it was seen as rational architecture, because most of the building is, this, the building is held up by the columns, which is really what allows all the windows to be around and, this, and the skylights. But then the history of what it was as an employer for, you know, for the region in 27, 1927, everybody must know Nabisco. Um, I don't think, it, I don't know what it exists as anymore. I think RJR Reynolds bought it at some point, but, you know, the number of people that were employed by the factory at a certain point was over four or 500 people. Um, and so the building sat pretty derelict for a period of years. And I'm just sort of curious, since, of course, you haven't been up here since that time, um, you know, what your impressions are, actually, of going from that moment and then really seeing, of course, Dia Beacon and a train station that didn't exist in this um, form at a certain point. I mean, it's really been the whole transformation of an area. Um, so just curious. You've been before, back and forth a few times here. Um, Laura, this is your first time back. I don't, think, I don't have, a, I, all I, I don't have enough of a sense of the, of the mm -hmm. community to be able to respond to that. I, I only can respond to, oh, wow, the, 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 you know, the, this, the shifts of the building, which are pretty apparent between what you see today and what, the, the, what we filmed. Yeah, I mean, I've been up here before um, and, and have watched what was going to happen. I mean, the minute the Dia moved in <laughs> was that this community was going to change. And so you can certainly see that change. Uh, to my dismay, when I came up uh, in March, when Sango was installing her show, uh, I hadn't been here in a while. And it, it looks like it's been overdeveloped, which is really sad, because it didn't look like that in the beginning, uh, when people started coming up to mm. Dia. Uh, so, but I think that's, that was part of probably the reason that 
uh, the deal went down for the, the way the deal went down was that it was going to be able to be an economic engine if for no other reason than tourists would be coming from New York City mm -hmm. to come up here. Um, and that's going to change the community. Yeah, that transformed, and I think Newburgh as well. Um, so, you know, this is the plus and the minus that always happens, I think, in scenarios such as this. Um, you know, but I'm interested in your own, you know, um, with filmmaking, this, the Flags Wars was kind of a, a big thing at this point. Laura, you've gone on to make many more films. And um, I'm always interested also, uh, I have to say, it always it boggles my mind the whole way in which you make yourself present in films when you're filming something that could be an incredibly hostile situation. I mean, here you had a very nice police officer who maybe just was overwhelmed and didn't want to do that, but, you know, address, uh, uh, arrest you. But, you know, you're in scenarios where you have to be kind of in the background as a, as a, when you're filming, but at the same time also navigate a lot. And I just... Well, I mean, first of all, like, what harm could we do? I mean, like, I mean, it was a, an abandoned building. Like, I, I don't think we were any threat to any property or, you know, so I, I, um, uh, I mean, it's good that we didn't get arrested, I guess. But, um, but I don't think it was some great threat. I don't think he needed to take our IDs. And, um, but it was, I mean, it was an, a pivotal moment, I, I think, probably for both Linda and I. We, we had met I, after... Jam had um, had um, had closed, and she was like, "I'm, move, you know, I wanted to." She wanted to make films, and we met um, doing a workshop. She did an incredible film called My Am, which um, you know, it's just really extraordinary, ex more experimental. I was doing more. I was I was making films at that time on, on 16 millimeter. They were also more in an experimental genre. So we had sort of met um, both making films, and then and then Flag Wars was this sort of turn towards observational sort of verite um, documentary, which we loved in the sort of tradition of D.A. Penny Baker and Albert Maisel's and that kind of the, the, the drama of human, human life and, and struggles and how we could understand complex political issues about society through spending time with people and really being with them um, over a period of time and, and that the sort of the story and the journey with following people would, would shed light onto larger questions in this case it was about um, race, class, um, sexual uh, orientation and, and how those play out in a larger society, but, but very much grounded in stories of people. Yeah, I was going to say the whole turn toward documentary, which allows something that's quite different than the nature of experimental film. Well, I shouldn't say that, but when you mentioned D.A. Pennebaker, that kind of approach, which really reveals stories, makes them very public in a way that, um, and film is its own power as in terms of storytelling. Um, have you, um, I'm, I'm curious, Linda, in other, you know, your thoughts on filmmaking um, and, and doing other things, if maybe we'll see Still Lives as a film in which this may make an appearance. Um, is that? Let me just say this, in, in terms of, um, in terms of film, I, I, I love making films, I really do. It is like heaven to me. Um, and that's, that's shooting, that's building, especially building the relationships with the people you're filming, whether they're folks living in their houses in their neighborhood or whether it's actors. I mean, just, it's, it's heaven. Um, I made a decision when I started Project Eats in 2009 um, to push the camera aside because that was during a time back in 2007, 2008. Some of you may remember that there was a global food crisis that was caused by a hike in the price of cereal crops. And it was global, and it meant that anybody who lived on limited incomes didn't have money to buy food because the price of food in grocery stores was too high. And that was, like I said, around the world. And so I decided to do this web series that followed the impact of that because in America, one of the things that was happening, and several of my favorite comics, you know, <laughs> uh, Steve Colbert being one, uh, were making jokes about uh, people going to big box stores and buying 100 pound bags of flour and et cetera. And at that time, I was working on a documentary about our electoral, electoral um, uh, system. 
and uh, following it from the perspective of people who chronically did not vote. And I happened to have been a non-voter uh, at that time and was just drawn by that. Like, it's not a viable, this is not a viable solution. <laughs> why, do, why do we not why do we not vote? And a lot of it comes out of something that we actually learned when we were shooting Flag Wars, because in that community, which is the community I grew up in, um, it was possible to vote on whether or not the neighborhood became um, a landmarked, designated a landmark uh, district, which is typically what happens in the process of gentrification, is the first thing, is one of the things you do. And um, and it passed that it was going to get designated that. And so when we're shooting, I'm asking people, including my parents, uh, you know, so what's up with this? How did, there's more, <laughs> there's more folks who have been here for a long, long time than those that are just moving in. Why did that happen? And the response was, uh, and I'll quote Baba, who was one of our main characters, was, uh, uh, they don't have power over me that I don't give them. And I realized that I had lived my whole life that way, too. No one has power over me. I don't believe, and I still fundamentally believe that, everybody in this room. No one has power over us that we don't give them. We have choice, except if it's an accident, right? If somebody walks in here with a gun right now and says, get on the floor, you have a choice you can make. You can take that chance to either get on the floor and hope you don't get shot, or you can say, no, motherfucker. <laughs> you know? But you have that choice. So anyway, and I realized that was, that's part of a, a way of existing in a hostile world, uh, if you're the people on the side of the hostility. And so um, I wanted to explore that more through what was called the vote. So I was working on another documentary. Um, and the global food crisis hit while I was working on that. And I said, hmm. Let's do a web series, because the people that we're working with uh, in initially about 13 cities, and then it became six cities, and it became the Active Citizen Project, and people in communities that we were partnering with were creating their own platforms, both national and local platforms, and then campaigning for them during election periods for their, their neighbors to vote for their platforms. Blah, blah, blah. Um, flip cameras, not phones at that time gave out flip cameras to folks in six cities. Uh, people were recording this footage, and it wasn't a joke. Uh, what was happening was that you know, mothers were deciding whether or not uh, what, they, what they could or could not eat that day in order to buy formula or to buy you know, just essential things to feed their kids. Um, and, uh, and I came across some footage from Haiti where people were forced to eat mud pies spiked with pebbles and honey, um, because they could not afford. Haiti, thanks to great you know, trade agreements and World Bank loans, Haiti is dependent on food from outside of Haiti. Doesn't have an agricultural industry anymore. So anyway, um, here they were having to eat mud pies. And there was all, you know, on these market stands, there was all this food from elsewhere that they couldn't buy. And it was in that moment, as I'm trying to edit that footage, and I'm sobbing, and I'm what kind of world do we fucking live in? And I said, we should all be able to grow our own food, even if it's on concrete, which is New York City. So if you can grow food in New York City, you can fucking grow it anywhere. So I said, hmm, as much as I love this film stuff, I really love making films, this is going to be more fulfilling. And I made that choice. So whether I make films, I want to, I still want to, I want to do it with Project Eats now, that Project Eats is operating. Um, but, um, you know, there's so many ways to just find out who you are, find out about the world you live in by making choices that put you right in the middle of the things that we aren't happy with, but for some reason we have not found a way individually and collectively outside of political systems and representatives that we elect to make the changes we need in the communities that we live in. And we fucking can do it. We just got to do it. It's just so beautifully said. And I mean, I think there's so many different forms of activism. And so, you know, that's one, one way that makes this, that changes things. And I just, you know, Laura, I, you know, I know you've talked about this so much, so I hope you don't mind me asking. And 
I think then we'll, we'll take some questions, is, you know, of course, your most recent film, um, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, about the whole, oh, uh, I don't even know how to describe what the Sacklers did, but how horrific it's been, and, and, and what, it, what was accomplished I mean, uh, through you pain. You have to call it murder. I mean, you, they murder. knew. They, knew. They, were, they, yes. they, they had the evidence early on. They were doctors. They sat around the table. They saw the numbers. They saw people were dying. They said, how do we sell more? I, And what pain as an organization has, um, I mean, it's a pretty momentous thing to get the name off the Metropolitan Museum. Um, I mean, what, what was accomplished? Right. I mean, so, I mean uh, uh, and, and I'll try to connect it to here as well. Like, I mean, so it's a film about Nan Golden, um, the artist Nan Golden, and who began an organization called Pain to t confront the Sacklers in the space that she felt she could, which was in the museum spaces. Um, but what sort of resonates for me as I sit here is the kind of where what I hope to do in that film was you know look at art not from the art world perspective but like as a human need as a desire as a form of communication and I feel that that's so so much also grounded in the work that that Linda carries you know through everything that she does you know like you know creating jam and and I just remember like being introduced to her and then this world of artists that you know that she would create and this sense of community like that it was around and that community was not about you know the this the selling of art right or the you know that the marketplace of art but like art as survival and and, and as a human you know is something that that people do um to to communicate and how essential it is and that it's for everyone and, and um so there is i think kind of parallels maybe um um in in the way that sort of nan embodies um or how she moves in the world and how linda moves in the world that there's that it's sort of coming from a place of like um um a desire to, you know, express and communicate and build community in a in 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 a way that sort of says, you know, fuck you to to main mainstream society. Yeah, I mean, it's about breaking in. Yeah. I mean, it really. I mean, I say that metaphorically, but I mean the idea to sort of. There's a lot of risk that's also entailed um, in what you in in breaking in in that way or taking on Sackler. Um, and you know, in the projects that you've done, but I think this kind of activism and thinking about how art through art or it, it, within communities built through art, these things can be accomplished, which is an, you know another a model, if you will, than what we often think of with the art world, whatever that. I always like to say to people, where is that on the map? Where is that art world thing? That, you know, but but it's you make your own basically. And I remember, I mean, I, I would say I, I believe that Project Eats is a work of art. Very much so, and but I remember early on when we were you were talking about like I had this idea to create a space for food and art and bring these two things together, and so like these sort of ideas that were you know we were talking about when we first met, and then to see how she sort of um, made them happen in the world. It's yeah. So I'd like to open it to questions. I already see a hand there, so I know you're eager to. I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll respond, but um, let me say this. One of the things that really shocked me in uh, the response to Flag Wars, 
and and I'll and I'll say I was I was really disappointed um, because at film festivals, you know, when we were screening the film and going around uh, in the Q and A sections, it was really interesting to me the ability that we have not to see ourselves. And there were so many people in those audiences <laughs> that were those characters that they could not see. And they would say, well, that's not me, right? That's not me, that's not me. And I thought we really hit it out the park in terms of what we wanted to achieve in showing all of the people in the community through their voices, through their experiences, for sure we edited. But we also had made a pact to, to really be as true as we could possibly be on a conscious level of the characters, of the people we followed who were the characters in the film. And so to go from one audience to another audience to another audience where people could not engage that truth, right? Could not discuss it among themselves in a fucking theater, right? I was really, I was very discouraged by that. Uh, and I think it's even harder today. Does it mean you don't try? Of course you try. Um, but part of that trying is really being imaginative and creative enough to know what's going to hit now, the consciousness and the awareness, the awareness and the honesty that we need to be able to see ourselves and from that figure out how we make it different, if we really want to make it different. Otherwise, we're just bullshitting each other. You know. I thought the realtor that you followed, uh, one of the realtors in Flag Wars, was probably, I don't want to say the most honest, but she sort of saw both sides of the coin. I remember her it, it, talking about, she was really conscious of the, you know, she wanted to market those buildings and sell these new, Vic, these old Victorian buildings. At the same time, she also knew it was going to happen as a result of it. Um, I don't know if you're, you know, but there was, the, the, she really struck me in a certain way because she just somehow like encapsulated the whole thing. And then there were other the new members of the community that were, you know, um, there's a whole thing about a guy's sign. That was a sort of fabulous thing, but it wasn't really a sign. It was his address. And, um, and, and what, you know, one person saying, well, but, but it's a sign. It doesn't belong in the historic district. Like just such a, a insularity and a very narrow minded way Way of thinking about their own terrain um, and then the implications of it. But there was a realtor there who somehow, I mean, the last person I would say would be the honest person would be, no offense to anybody you know who's a realtor here, by the way, but it was something about she knew what was going to happen when all these homes were being sold and fixed up and property values would go up and the taxes would go up and she knew it was going to happen. So it, it's a terrific film. So do, do find it and see it because it's uh, really amazing. And I, I did yeah, live in I Columbus, have, Ohio oh, for four years. So oh, jeez, Louise. <laughs> After, before that, you. actually. So. I couldn't wait to get out. <laughs> um, I, I just, uh, the reason I'm chuckling uh, as you're talking, Donna, because I'm going to just say, your take on Nina and the experience of Nina were very different. And I will say <laughs> this, that in the, um, the screening at the Wexner, so... Uh, yeah, Columbus, Ohio, the, both communities come to see a screening. They had to do a second screening because it was only going to be one. I think then they did the second one. Anyway, and after the first screening, uh, and there was a, a talk with the main characters, and as we're getting off the stage, Nina declares that she's going to kick my ass. And I said, you can't kick my ass, bitch. <laughs> you just can't do that. But anyway, so <laughs> I appreciate your take on Nina. But she, was, she wanted to kick my ass because uh, she felt that she had been misrepresented in the Maybe film. she said more than she had intended to say. <laughs> Are there other questions or did you want to respond to any other questions? Give us a few more minutes. This is your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you all. And I, I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Kim Golding, who for helping organize all of today. <laughs>